Welcome to Your Path to Nonprofit Leadership, the weekly podcast that features the very best in career development in the nonprofit sector. I'm your host, Patton McDowell, and in addition to podcasting, I am a leadership coach, a mastermind facilitator, best selling author, and a speaker. I love taking these nonprofit leadership topics on the road or into your Zoom room. So if you need someone for your next conference or workshop, check out my new speaking page at pattonmcdowell.com for more information. But if you're looking for a great episode on establishing yourself as a new leader at a nonprofit, you've come to the right place. Sherry Chisholm is the executive director of an organization called Leading on Opportunity, which, by the way, in and of itself has wonderful uh, advice for those of you working in your communities to improve economic mobility for everyone in your area. But what makes Sherry's insight so valuable is that she's not only had to utilize all of her leadership skills, she had to do it at a time when she was arriving in a community new to her. And by the way, she did it during COVID with a newborn. So despite all of the challenges of leadership, she had even more and has done remarkably well. And of course, what makes this conversation so valuable for you is that she's been very thoughtful about the lessons she's learned, the advice she received that has helped her. And she, of course, is going to share that with you. So for your next move or in your current leadership role, you're going to find many things to take away. I know you're going to want to check out the show notes for this episode so that you can find out more about Sherry and the work she's doing at Leading on Opportunity. This is episode number 197. Just go to the new podcast page at pattonmcdowell.com and you'll find out all of the resources that Sherry and I discuss. Of course, more information on her and her organization. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Sherry Chisholm. Sherry, thank you for joining me on the path. Patton, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited about this conversation, Sherry. You've got a wonderful leadership journey to share. And you are especially adept, I think, at handling transition, if I can Mm -hmm. use that as a starting topic, because there are a lot of nonprofit leaders listening right now that have maybe made a recent transition Mm -hmm. into a new community, or they're thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And so you have literally been through it. So I'm eager to kind of uh, pick your brain on that topic. In fact, let me ask you, as you move to Charlotte into an opportunity that we'll be discussing a lot, um, what was the biggest challenge of kind of integrating into a new community? Yeah, um, you know, I have entered new communities before as a part of my role, um, working in school districts, but always as a part of a team coming in with a new superintendent. Uh, this was my first time coming in as the second executive director into a new community. Uh, and I think that that, you know, coming in to a community where there was already an established um, expectation, or I, I think a better word is reputation about the organization, and then coming in as the newbie to take that over was really challenging. Right. Um, my organization in particular was one that had a pretty large presence in community. And in a lot of ways had not lived up to the hope that was promised. And so my role was to revamp the org, re-energize folks. Um, and I learned, which, which was really exciting to me. Um, I did not anticipate all of the cultural dynamics of a new city in the South that I would need to understand in order to do that well. Well, maybe we can get to that. Talk about your previous stops. That led to, of course, we'll talk about leading on opportunity and your arrival to Charlotte, but other experiences that maybe have built to this point in your professional career? Yeah, well, I think I've learned pretty quickly how to be good at making fast friends. So um, I've had a very winding road in my professional (laughs) career. I started um, as a corporate consultant with Deloitte. So I traveled around the country. I'm going into new organizations and new communities to help them solve problems. And then it was sometimes problems they thought they had, sometimes problems they didn't. And, you know, folks who have any familiar familiarity with consultants, um, we often come in to deliver bad news. Right. And so that role taught me really early on how to learn a business, how to learn a culture and how things operate 
um, in a certain organization and to build trust with the people there in order to do work well. So that's a skill that continues to serve me and that I um, rely on heavily. And then I transitioned that experience into, um, into the, the public service space. So the majority of my career has been in leading large urban school districts. And so in each time I was coming in as a part of the new superintendent's new team. So we're coming into an established organization, just like I was in consulting, um, with the hope of education reform. And so that meant oftentimes changing staff, coming out with new visions and strategic plans. Again, is, is the plans are only as great as the folks who are willing to adopt them. Yeah. And so developing the skill to learn a community, build trust and relationships is something that I found and set realistic expectations. I already want to say that as well. It's something that I've, those skills I've continued to hone along the way um, that, that I also brought with me here to Charlotte. Well, I'm delighted to unpack that further because you've done it very well. And clearly those experienced previously have helped you um, but as I'm sure you will agree that every community is different. And so you had to navigate mm -hmm. some of those nuances and subtleties that do exist. Um, but before we go too much further, uh, if you would share with our audience, what is Leading on Opportunity? Yeah, I'd be delighted to. So Leading on Opportunity is an initiative that um, nested here in Charlotte, North Carolina, with the hope of improving economic outcomes for all children in Mecklenburg County, which is the, the county that Charlotte sits in. Um, it's also one of the largest, I think, Pat, you can correct me, maybe the largest county here in um, North Carolina. Right. And we were, um, the organization came about based on a study that was released out of Harvard in 2014 that ranked all major urban cities according to one's ability to rise out of poverty if born into it. So if you're born in an impoverished zip code, what's the likelihood that you would die in that impoverished zip code? And um, it's pretty significant here in Charlotte. We were dead last on that list, which meant it's really difficult to rise out of poverty or born into it here. And so our hope at Leading on Opportunity is that we provide um, the strategy, data, and policy to nonprofits who attempt to uh, deliver direct service to help them do their work and deliver programming better. And then also on the opposite end, we provide insights via data to uh, funders to help them make smarter investments. And the hope is that those resources and activities are aligned and we can collectively move faster and more effectively as a community um, towards the outcome of all residents here. Yeah, I love that. And again, it's, I think, something that many nonprofit leaders, particularly if they're in the social services or educational sectors as you are, um, are wrestling with that. And we'll talk mm -hmm. about that a bit more. But if I could go back to that fundamental challenge, was it, Sherry, difficult because you, you inherited an organization that maybe many in the community didn't fully understand what you were doing or what? I guess you yeah. immediately had to become an ambassador for something that may not be totally clear. Yeah, I mean, there there were two things happening, um, and I want to be very open in the hope of helping others who might be um, in my position. So I would say there were two challenges that um, impacted one another. One was organizational, and then the other was my own personal or professional um, approach or, or uh, approach or style. So on an organizationally, the leading on opportunity was established in 2016. There was an initial executive director and team. Um, many people tell me it was one of, if not the largest, um, co community announcements. Many people rally rallied around from corporate to nonprofit, the faith-based community, and government. Really excited about improving outcomes for um, charlatans. And there was a lot of excitement and there was also a lot of confusion around what success looked like, what exactly, what role would lead in on opportunity play, given that we are a traditional nonprofit to providing direct service, how would we measure our outcomes? So you're right, there was a lot of confusion um, and lack of understanding about the organization and miss expectations, right? Like there was people started with great will and hope and in many ways, folks felt like it had fallen flat. So there was, you know, organizationally, there was a need for me to define the organization, to um, win back credibility and trust. That takes time. And so that was, I knew yeah. the first thing that I needed to do. 
And in order to do that, I needed to be able to, um, what I learned, clearly understand how work happens in Charlotte. Um, and I, you know, when I was hired, they said that they wanted a dynamic leader with a strong <laughs> vision, um, a clear perspective. I am a northerner. I am from the Midwest. I have, like I said, spent most of my career in government. And I think that those, you know, both my upbringing and professional experience, there's um, a directness, an assertiveness, um, a no nonsense kind of approach that I had developed around what it meant to, for Sherry to be a leader. And I came in that way um, and quickly stubbed my toe. <laughs> really? Uh, yeah. For, I think, you know, while that, while the things, um, what I want to say, while they, the organization and community did want answers to their question, they wanted a vision around what would happen next with leading on opportunity. I learned that in coming to Charlotte that, and this may be, a, you know, a reflection of the South, that Charlotte is the you know, a big, the, what do they call it, the biggest small town. Yeah. And so there's a um, massaging that needs to happen in the messaging um, I tend to be a front door person. I learned that side door probably is more effective here. Um, and I think it's more so about respecting the work and foundation that people have been working so hard to uh, put into place and building on that as opposed to pointing out that the things that were negative that I was going to fix. Is, is that clear? Uh, very clear. And, and okay. you said it well. It, it Again, tackling the nuances and the politics of any community, particularly, and, and I bet every community from which our listeners hail, you know, they're high profile task forces and studies. Mm -hmm. And of course, everybody gets excited and everybody wants immediate uh, progress. And as you said, this is not stuff that's going to change overnight. Right. Um, but let me ask you about kind of your personal onboarding strategy. So you realize, all right, I've got to get to know the right people what was that literally among the tactics you employed are everybody you talked to said all right you need to talk to so and so or how did you onboard yourself to a community of personalities some more evident and some more subtle oh i love this question <laughs> um i so i had two onboardings and i think it's important for me to share or two that were happening simultaneously so one uh, it's important to know that I moved to Charlotte and accepted this role um, September 2020. So we were very much so still in a pandemic. Um, and it's also important for folks to know that I was seven months pregnant. So I came to Charlotte when things were, you know, primarily shut down and we were on Zoom. And then also I had this huge, the biggest personal shift that has ever occurred in my life happening at the same time. And so I, you know, in all honesty, I knew that I had to get myself well and established so that I could show up in, at work the way I wanted to. Right, right. And so I started with, and it actually really worked to my advantage to get me um, established with finding like the medical care that I needed. So I established myself with a doctor, making sure that I had somewhere where I could work out because I wanted to continue uh, my like, prenatal health. Um, making sure that I understood where the, the public parks were so that I could get out and in nature, even though things like gyms were not open, um, was really important to me. And while I don't think I would, I would love to say that I had the, like the foresight at the time to know that that would really plant me in Charlotte. It did. And it was really, really helpful to me to understand the community, both geographically and understanding how, you know, where certain economic, um, areas were more um, wealthy than others. It helped me to connect with people personally, to hear stories about the community and where they had gone to school and what they thought was going on, completely independent of, of work, which gave right. me a different perspective I wouldn't have otherwise. So that's something that I would recommend that people take with them is figure out what it looks like for you to plant yourself. What, would it, what does it look like for it to be home for you? And you'll learn a lot about the community just by exploring the things that make you happy. Love that advice. Um, Sorry to interrupt you, Sherry, yeah. but I, I, it's worth underlining because you're right. I think many of us, as we ponder leadership transition, we're focused on the job. Right. right. I just I'm, it's, it's, it's all about the job, my boss, my colleagues. And you were saying, hey, I need to make sure this community is a good fit and right. has the resources, I guess, for me to be my best leadership self. I've got to be my best self in general. 
Right. Yeah, absolutely. You know, all leadership roles, but those in nonprofit in particular, I have found to be really, you know, emotionally and mentally challenging who you are and who as a person and what you deliver as a professional. They're intertwined always. It's head and hard work, head and heart work all the time. And so I have found it really important to take care of myself because if I don't take care of me, then I can't take care of my team and, and do the work. Um, that we've signed up to do. So, so that's something I would I would definitely recommend and it's really helped me fall in love with Charlotte quite quickly. Um, and then on a professional side, I like you said, Patton, you know, I was provided with a list of people to talk to that was very generously um, curated for me based on who um, who my onboarding team thought I needed to meet. But what I did is I took that as a starting point. So there were maybe 15 or 20 names on that list. And we all, we met virtually because folks weren't meeting in person. And at the end of each conversation, I asked for three more people I should be talking to because nice. I wanted my web to grow. Um, you know, we'll, we'll get into conversations around social capital, but oftentimes for most people, the people in your social network are very similar to you. And I knew that I wanted a diversity of experiences. So in the first 90 days, I met either individually or in groups on Zoom with over 100 people. Wow. And that really helped to, to give me a more a rounded picture of, you know, folks in corporate, grassroots, nonprofit government to hear all their voices around a similar topic. And I found that they were quite varying, but I could weave them together to bring together some common themes that help frame my, um, like the next 90 days around what success would look like for me as an ED and for the organization. I, I, as a fan of a book by Michael Watkins called The First 90 Days, I love yes. that you're thinking in 90 day increments, quarterly increments, I guess, at, at a high level, Sherry, I, I, it, it sounds like you had kind of an agenda of a key few key questions for each of these interviews or mm -hmm. tactically, how'd you do that? Did you have an agenda? You took notes and then you, you began to assemble this kind of wealth of knowledge from all these interviews? Yeah, that's exactly right. I started with, as I recall, maybe three or four questions max. And I really wouldn't recommend more than that because you could build on that. And they're really simple. So like what... I think they were, you know, what is leading on opportunity done well? Um, what, what could we be doing better? Um, what would success look like for the new leader? Um, those were those, I think those were the questions. And then that would open up the door to a variety of stories and perspectives. And I took tons and tons and tons of notes. <laughs> I can um, imagine. Just in, in, in words. Like I wish I could say I had a more savvy tool, but I took them in words. And it was just in one place for me to go back to and I comb them to pull out common themes and pretty quickly they would arise. Um, and for me, it was around what I heard was that you needed that the community didn't trust you. And so you needed to focus on being present in community. I knew that I would have to hire a really strong team yeah. um, and that came up and then also in getting clear on what expectations were. No matter where people sat in the community, everyone wanted at least those kind of three foundational things. How long did it take, Sherry, for you to get, I don't guess we ever totally get comfortable or never accept the fact that we always can learn new things, but do you find that there was a kind of a milestone point? Was it at the end of the first 90 or the second 90 or the third 90? Or where were those kind of key moments in your orientation, if you will? Yeah, I feel like I took a breath after the first year. <laughs> so it was, and I would say <laughs> any job. This I tell people when the first year you don't know what's important, so everything's important, right? You're on high alert about everything. Um, at least that's been my approach. Um, and so I really needed to learn the role. What and a, and a lot was changing for us too, from you know bringing in new funding, hiring a new team, expanding the board. It was a lot happening, but I, by the end of the first year, most of that was complete. Um, and then we could focus on strategy. We were, you know, effectively in a um, a turnaround situation. Right. So for me, the first year or even year and a half, I said I was getting our house in order. We needed to be reflective internally of the values we said we hold before we could deliver anything externally. And for me, that helped give me a, 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 a kind of provided some breathing room because not only did I have a vision, but then everyone around me from my, you know, supervisor and governing board to staff also held that vision. And so it gave me the confidence that we could de really deliver on what we promised. 
were there certain resources, Sherry, that have helped you? Clearly, you're very self-sufficient, um, so I'm not suggesting you needed any help, but I guess we all can use help sometimes, right? And, right. you know, I, I mentioned the first 90 Days book is one that's helped me at various career junctions, but I wonder, historically and in this new job, did you turn to certain people for help, or have you found help from mentors or coaches or any other resources that you might offer to our listeners? I would say all of the above. I think, you know, some, I think some people, or maybe there's a saying that like you're born to be a leader. Maybe, maybe that's true. I think that it's a skill that, well, I would say for me, it's something I'm constantly working on. I'm right. constant, I want to learn from people who've been in experiences from similar to mine, or maybe vastly different. I make a point of studying. It may sound a, a little kooky, but I love to hear different faith-based leaders give messages and sermons. I think you learn, for me, I learn a lot about how to deliver a message in a way that resonates with people that doesn't use data and jargon, but right. still communicates even more effectively um, the message you intend. So yes, so I think two big, two um, big things that I did in particular in, in this role is I sought an executive coach. Um, you know, I said I, I stubbed my toe early on in learning the political dynamics of, of a new community because there's what's on paper and then there's like actually what's happening. <laughs> And right, I, because right. I wasn't here, I didn't know that. And I didn't, you know, I wasn't sure who I could ask what. So I did, had developed one close friend here and I reached out to her and I said, hey, these are the things I'm struggling with. Like, I want to be successful. I know that I have a vision. I know I can do this work, but there's some just things about the cultural dynamics. I need someone to coach me on. Right. And so I, luckily through her, I was able to find an amazing executive coach who I could ask the tough questions or uncomfortable questions. And it was really great for me because she would say, yeah, you're not crazy. What you're experiencing, you are. And this is how you navigate it. Um, so that was that was transformational in terms of my success here. And we meet once a week, um, and especially during those early, early uh, months. We met very frequently for me to check in with her as I prepared for significant meetings, as I was thinking about my funding strategy. She was great with that. And then to balance that perspective, um, and this is something I did here and try to do as often as I can, is to nest myself specifically in a national development, national professional development program. Nice. Um, it's important to know your community, but sometimes you can, like the group think could happen. Um, and so when you meet with people who are dealing with similar challenges in other environments or contexts, I find that there's always a great opportunity to learn and also really safe space to share. And so I was a part of the Pahara Institute um, in my onboarding here, and it was an opportunity for me to share my challenges with them um, and also just to develop like colleagues in the space who I can still come back to and lean on, even though the program has ended. Love that. I certainly want to lift up as a big fan of coaching myself and, and the power of strategic networking, which you have been very effective at doing, it sounds like, through that network. And I guess I want to come to your defense, though, here, Sherry, for a moment. You mentioned that you stubbed your toe, but in in, in your defense, you don't know what you don't know. Uh, or yeah. as you reflect back on the, quote, tub stubbing of the toe, what mm -hmm. would you do different or what could you have done different, I guess, in retrospect? I mean, it's like you, you, we all in going to a new community, you're just not going to be aware of some of the subtleties of the politics. And you said, I guess when you said that you stubbed your toe, you're just, you were speaking out perhaps on something and then learn later that, Hey, that was something yeah. that was discussed before you got here. Is that, that was, example? that's exactly right. Yeah, yeah exactly right. Um, I appreciate the push. You know, I, like many people can be hard on myself like I, i'm the a student right i want to get it right but sometimes exactly. i think you have to <laughs> have to make some mistakes to learn um and so it things turned around faster than i thought they would um but in the, i remember during that time it, it was challenging i was like you know did i make the wrong decision do they really want me can i show up as myself and all of the answers to all those questions are yes yes and yes but then it, it takes time to figure out exactly the right approach well, again, I'm very confident that you have found the right approach and you were doing great work for our community. And of course, the work you're doing is uh, universal, I guess. And in fact, let me start with some of these concepts that you are helping educate the community and helping elevate uh, economic mobility. All right. mm -hmm. What does that mean? What, yeah. what, literally do you, what, what does that mean? And, and yeah, what can we do about it? 
In layman's terms, the idea of economic mobility is that each generation is doing better than a generation before them financially in terms of um, their financial resources and what they're able to amass. Um, how I explain it to children is you have what you need to get where you want to go. Um, and because economic mobility, people come back to your financial situation, that is determined by a variety of other factors. Um, in Charlotte, we talk about it in terms of five big areas. It is um, child and family stability. The types of indicators of child and family stability are stable housing, healthcare, food, transportation. That makes one more stable and leads to better financial outcomes. We talk about early um, childhood education, so pre-K, daycare uh, programs that are provided to have been uh, show evidence of, of better outcomes throughout your educational career. College and career readiness, so your ability to not only enter, um, enter a post-secondary training or college program or go on to workforce, but matriculate, so stay longer than a year. Um, and then the other two, which I'm really proud of Charlotte for taking the bold step towards addressing are the impact of segregation, which we cannot ignore um, in our country, has impacted one's ability to progress if a person of color. Um, and then social capital. So who you know? Do you know someone you can call in a favor to to get something done? So all of those things work together to improve your financial um, earning potential as an adult. And I would argue that we can't have one without the other. And if we were to explore our own personal experiences, it would be hard to say, well, if I didn't come from a two parent um, home, but had gone to college, my experiences would be the same. We don't know. Right. Right. And so we are working um, diligently here in Charlotte to um, improve all of those areas with the hope of increasing outcomes for all children. Uh, fantastic definition. Thank you. And it strikes me that among the things you are good at and have to be good at is convening and creating collaboration, right? I mean, leading on opportunity is going to be a beacon for this topic mm -hmm. of economic mobility. But is that true? The nature of your work is literally rallying all of the resources related to those five areas you just, just shared with us? Yes and moving us toward outcomes. So I cannot take the credit or I wanna give credit where credit is due in terms right. of the community was already kind of coalesced around the shared language. When I came in, you know, you would see economic mobility on everybody's website from the, you know, for-profit, I'm sorry, the for-profit yeah, for um, organization to the nonprofit to a concert venue. I just saw yesterday, list of economic <laughs> it mobility. It was a hot topic, right? It was a hot phrase for everybody. <laughs> And so, but that shared language in the community really set up, set up, uh, set us all up for success to act. But we were having some like fits and starts on what that looked like. And so, our responsibility at leading on opportunity was to move the community from shared language to shared action. Yep. And this is where I say I, I hearken back to my consulting experience um, that continues to serve me well is that many communities, Charlotte included, can be really great at getting folks in the room. Like we're just gonna get the right people in a room and magic is gonna happen. Unfortunately, things really don't happen that way. You yeah. need to get everyone yeah. in a room and then have you know, a shared plan of action moving forward. What does success look like? What information do we need to analyze together so that we can make data informed decisions? That's what leading on opportunity is really great at doing. We are not the experts in any of those five areas, but we know how to get work done. And so we bring the strategy in terms of facilitation, the policy in terms of history and connection and the, the data that we need to folks in the community and in corporate spaces so they can work together to identify what the next best step looks like for us here in Charlotte. Well, again, as you gather the data and share the data and educate the community, you have to hold the community accountable, I guess. Yeah. Is that fair? You you acknowledge that sometimes you're going to have to push the community and, and that may not always be well received. Yeah, Pat, and you're hitting on all the things. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's really exciting to talk about, but, you know, the rubber meets the road at some point. And in right, Charlotte, right. in any community I've experienced in Atlanta and Palm Beach, in L.A., in Detroit, is that communities can, you know, be... Um, what is it called? Short attention spans, right? right like we're doing right. this and then we're doing that and then it's hunger and then it's housing and economic mobility. And one thing that, you know, I was really clear that the community wanted and I wanted to be able to provide was a commitment to this work. 
everyone knew that it was important, but we hadn't seen progress of change. And so we started by developing a data tool that we thought would speak to our corporate community here in Charlotte, but also include the voice of those who were living the experience to say, you know, we know that Chetty is never coming back. We don't know if we'll continue to be on the bottom of that list or if we moved up one or two. And actually, that doesn't matter. But what's important right. to us in Charlotte is that we make good on the commitments that we made to ourselves and our neighbors. And so our measurement tool does that. So we're able to see our progress every two or three years as opposed to waiting 30 to 40 years at a time for an external organization to tell us if we're doing a good job. And I think it's important to note that yes, that's accountability, but people all want, also wanna see measures of progress. So it's also a motivating uh, tool as well. Yeah, uh, well, I, I wanna talk more about that tool and how you articulate, because you, you said it very well. At first, everybody's excited, right? To talk to you, Sherry, mm -hmm. about, oh yes, economic mobility, that's the rally cry. But I mm -hmm. wonder, it's the, the second, third and fourth time when you're coming back and say, hey, we got to make more progress, right? As yeah. you said, we got to hit the rubber, hit the road. And ha have you adjusted your message to some extent to to amplify oh, or yeah. clarify? Significantly, you know, you started the um, our the, at the top of this talk by saying that the work is long. It absolutely is, and that right. was, I think, that was a, a, a smaller challenge, but a significant one nonetheless. Is reframing folks' expectation around how quickly. Um, this work moves. And by quick, it doesn't. It's very slow. You know, in Charlotte, um, we are a, a corporate banking town. And I think, you know, many folks are used to measuring progress quarter by quarter. Progress around systems and movement change is quarter century by quarter century. Yeah. And that right. shift is really difficult for folks to grasp. But we are not in the business of destination work, but we're on a journey. And we'll progressively get a little better and a little better. And then we may come back a few steps and then maybe go up a few more. But that's how this work happens. And so we went through a total brand refresh. We were, I have been very intentional about the language we use in terms of success. Again, coming back to setting expectations, the first 90 days, the first 90 days in government is actually my favorite pattern. Oh, yeah, um, yeah. Right, reason, right. Setting those realistic expectations with, your team, with your board, and with the community helps to build trust. And so I was clear that I didn't want to commit to something we couldn't deliver on. And so a part of clarifying those expectations was educating people on what success would look like. And then, you know, hopefully they would come along in the journey with us. Yeah, you articulate that beautifully. And again, I think that's just such a good leadership lesson uh, because many of our colleagues listening now are, are doing mission work that is not going to be turned around in quarter to mm -hmm. quarter, as you said. And so that does, I think, put even more emphasis on the effective communication of these yeah, things. I, and yeah, please. I just want to add one thing, you know, going back to um, changing the messaging, I could say what I just said, and that resonates with some people. Yep. I found that giving examples of where folks had lived a change similar to that was also really helpful. Interesting. Uh, so telling for, a story or what, what telling, do you mean? Yeah, telling a story was helpful. And so what I, the example that I use, because the name of our data tool is the compass. So it tells right. you right. where you are and where you want to go. Um, I use the example of the evolution of GPS systems. And so I don't know, you know, even when I started my career, it was the garments that were the size of a small <laughs> TV. Exactly. Yes. On top of your dashboard and plug it in and quite literally hope and pray that it was updated with your route. Right. And now, fast forward, all of that technology is nested on a smartphone for us in the form of Google Maps or Waze and algorithms are built in that um, know us and are learning our patterns and can, you know, suggest better ways of getting to the same place. We didn't do away with GPS systems. It's not like we don't need them anymore, but we're getting smarter. And that's exactly what happens with community work towards economic mobility. You know, in the past 15 years, we've progressed, we're not done, but we'll continue to get better and better and better. And I think like having an example that folks can relate to is also helpful when it when it, with when the work is so urgent and it's kind of hard to hear that it's going to take a long time. Yeah, it's such a fantastic example and a, a wonderful way to think about the, a mental model, right? So yeah. that someone in your audience understands maybe better what you're trying to say. Because I do think we in the sector sometimes bury ourselves in our own jargon right mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. not realizing that somebody listening doesn't know exactly what we're talking about and that's why i think it's it's brilliant what you've done through the opportunity compass 
as both an educational and, and I guess a marketing tool to some extent, Sherry, is that, could you see, well, one, you, I think you've explained it, but is that a, a tool that maybe other nonprofit leaders ought to consider a way to illustrate what they're doing in a way that uh, allows them to share it more effectively? Yes, we would love that. So the Opportunity Compass is a data tool that measures our community progress towards hundreds of indicators. So it measures how we're doing in terms of homelessness, how we're doing in terms of graduation rate, all the things that work together to improve economic mobility. Um, and while it's specific to Charlotte, we all, it's a great tool that others could adopt in their community and also a variety of national resources we use to create it that I think other nonprofits would find beneficial. Um, so that's, I think, it's something that everyone could use. But more importantly for us, and you hinted at it, Patton, is we started with the Compass as our first deliverable because it's what the community told us was important to them. Yeah, you um, listen, you know, right? You listen. Yeah, it was. I that's what I heard during my listening and learning tour in the first um, few months is that we need to know if we're making progress. Like we want the data, but it was also clear to me from folks who weren't as privileged that they needed, they knew that they needed data, but didn't have the capacity or know how to create it. So in order to address both concerns, we responded with a data tool, but it is publicly available, thereby democratizing data. So yes, we're using data, we're responding to the corporate community and then also to the grassroots community by providing them with a tool and the information they need to effectively engage in conversation. So it was our first deliverable that we wanted to make sure spoke to all of our audiences. Yeah, love that. And again, I think there are many uh, nonprofit leaders listening who might be able to more effectively translate the complexity of the work they're doing and the data they're collecting in a way that, and again, it just gives you a built-in way to continue the communication, doesn't it, Sherry? I mean, you can constantly update it and provide that real time, I guess, without misleading and that it's going to change some of the outcomes overnight, but mm -hmm. it does give people something to stay focused on. Yeah, a goal to come back to. Um, we'll right. be updating it every you know two to three years, um, okay. and that's how often the data is available. Okay. Um, so we'll update it in that way. But yeah, it's a tool that people can continue to come back to for us to have conversations with the community about, and it grounds and anchors us in our work. Let me ask you, shifting gears just a moment, uh, the the relationship with your community foundation. Obviously, here in Charlotte, the Foundation for the Carolinas is a regional entity that's involved in lots of things, including. I guess the origins of the leading on opportunity uh, concepts here in this community. What's it like to be kind of embedded in or with your community foundation? How would you advise other nonprofit leaders saying, "Hey, Sherry, what what do you think I should do in terms of the community foundation in my town?" Yeah, so this is my this is my first go round. I can talk about the things that I've learned, and maybe folks can glean something from that. You know, Charlotte. Uh, I'm sorry, the Foundation for the Carolinas here in Charlotte is huge right. um, in terms of being a key influencer. And so I learned that it was to my benefit to speak to our um, partnership with the foundation, our understanding of how the organization works, um, because that helped me to win critical friends who valued and had worked with the foundation before. Um, I think, you know, with us being a part of the foundation, also there, when you say foundation, there are some connotations that come to mind, you know, giving away lots of money, which makes right, sense. Right. And that was something we were not doing as an organization. So as much as it was important for me to show that we were aligned to the values and goals of the foundation, I also had to create a distinction between leading on opportunity and the foundation. And the way I did that, and this may serve others, maybe not, is that we talked about and gave honor to the foundations of leading on opportunities starting at Foundation for the Carolinas. But I made the conscious decision for our office not to be located at the foundation because I wanted us to have our own identity. Um, when I looked to people who would be on my board, I was really looking for the non or the not the usual suspects. Right. Um, rather than right. pulling from those folks who are already engaged with initiatives at the foundation, what new faces could I bring? And so it was trying to strike that balance between, yes, we're in partnership with the foundation, but we also have our own brand and identity, and those two things can coexist. Yeah, I know you would explain that well, and that's a it seems to me the appropriate, speaking of alliance building and mm -hmm. partnerships, um, but you haven't been subsumed by the Foundation for the Carolinas either. You would need mm -hmm. to maintain an independent kind of presence in our community, which you have done very well. Um, 
Well, that's, I guess that's among my final questions for you, Sherry, and thank you again for the wisdom throughout this conversation. But as an organization focused on long term, uh, as you say, in, in uh, measurements of years and even decades, but how do you approach strategic planning? What's next for you as you look maybe just in the next year or so ahead? Mm -hmm. So for the next year for us, we've um, kind of coined the utilization year. So the first two, first year was about building, rebuilding the organization. The second year then was about creating this community tool, the Opportunity Compass that had been long awaited, which we launched successfully. Now we're really getting into the work. And so we want to work closely with nonprofits and foundations and funders to help them use the tool. Data is um, natural to some people and others not. Right. And so, like I said, we provide the supports to help you do your work better. So we'll be putting together different coalitions and gatherings to help people do that well. That's in terms of our, the programming we'll provide. And then, you know, from my perspective as the nonprofit leader is we're beginning to enter stabilization, just beginning. And so I am thinking differently around what is long term funding look like. So to exit a three year campaign to go into more like funding permanence. And then also be making sure that I'm continuing to coach and develop the team um, are probably my two major things. Like how do I make sure I'm setting them up for success as the tone of our organization moves from urgent to more well paced? Um, and then making sure I'm working um, to build that, to maintain the funding, which, you know, I would be remiss if I didn't mention is always on my <laughs> mind as an executive director of a nonprofit. Yes. I, I seldom have a conversation with a nonprofit leader like you that funding or fundraising isn't uh, early on the uh, conversational list, right? And so uh -huh. clearly it is on yours. And well, let me ask one follow up question, if I might, because again, you said it early and you said it here just now. The importance of building a strong team and mm -hmm. your ability to indeed attract talent and so if somebody listening here and then you have an opening let's say down the road sherry what are you looking for what would it what type of person are you looking for when you build an ideal team mm -hmm. well i'm looking for something different now than i was looking for when i started but when i started i really um, we're building the initial few folks on my team. I leaned into one of my mentors. His name is uh, Dr. Robert Avosa. He most recently was a superintendent in Palm Beach, but has since retired. Um, and his model for hiring folks was to hire smart people who would get the work done right. and then to create an environment of high expectations and high trust. Okay. So that's absolutely the model that I've developed and continue to bring forward in, non in nonprofit. So I won't be able to compete with corporate salaries, but I can create an environment where learning and risk taking is OK and that I will support you in doing that as long as you're working hard to meet and exceed expectations. And so that's something that um, that has really served me well. I think if you hear people talk about leading on opportunity, they talk about the team first. It is by far the magic um, to leading on opportunity. We have, you know, folks who are varying ages, ethnicities, income levels, but what each person brings is a passion and fire for this work. And I'd rather have that, you know, any day um, than having to inspire activity and action in folks. So that's, that's why I I think I answered your question, Pat. You did. You did beautifully. <laughs> okay. And and the, that's kind of a mantra uh, I think that many nonprofit leaders could follow, in terms of you really do want that kind of energy, the enthusiasm, mm -hmm. the spark. Uh, you you can teach and orient right in some of the content right. areas that you're going to have to, in terms of doing their job. But that that doesn't surprise me. And what you look for and how you built the team you certainly have now. Um, well, final question, uh, and mm -hmm. I'm serious this time. I know I keep saying final, but you have too many good responses for me to end. Um, other advice you would offer someone who says, Sherry, I want to jump into kind of a leadership path like you have been on. It, is there anything else? Because you've shared wonderful, I, I think, piece of advice throughout this conversation. But I wonder if there's anything else that comes to mind that you would say to someone like that. Come back to what I said earlier about taking care of yourself. Yes. And and seeking wise counsel. It's, you know, this work can be really challenging. We are in it because we love it, not because of, you know, the, the economic benefits often. Um, and so making sure that you have a community of people and practices around you that make you feel whole, whole on the hard days are really important. Um, 
And because leadership development is not, or professional development is not built into smaller nonprofits like you would from a larger corporation, create that for yourself. So if there are things you want to learn, if you want to grow, then it is your responsibility to add those things to your toolkit, whether it be a kitchen cabinet of folks you can trust or seeking out a fundraising training that would help you make that a regular part of your goal setting and practice. Beautiful. That's wonderful advice. Uh, combining several of the functions that you've alluded to throughout our conversation on your journey, and you packaged it uh, very well as someone now is thinking about, uh, again, following on your path or a path like yours. So for that, Sherry, I'm grateful. And of course, if I might ask for a parting gift, as mm -hmm. you know, we have uh, assembled a pretty nice reading list or reading recommendation list. And I wonder, do you have a book or two that maybe <laughs> has been meaningful to you that you share with our listeners? Well, we, we talked about one of them already. So the yep. first 70 days in government, gold, like everyone should read. Um, there are two versions, but I, I particularly like the first 90 days in government for nonprofit leaders because it considers, you know, things like budget, political dynamics, culture in an organization that I find that I'm needed in um, in school districts and in nonprofit. Sure, and the other sure. one I would add, um, which is on a totally different end of the spectrum, is a book called A Black Girl's Guide to Financial Freedom by Paris Woods. Nice. And I think this is particularly important for individuals who are interested in going to nonprofit. And the assumption is that you won't be financially well. That just right. does not have to be true. There are some different practices that you may need to put into place because we don't get, you know, an annual bonus or whatever that you would get from a corporate job. So making sure that you take care of your finances so that you can continue to stay in this work is really important. And so Paris writes um, really practical tips for how you can do that. And I would just really encourage anyone, but especially those who maybe don't come from wealth, to make sure they're exploring those types of things as well. It's fantastic, Sherry. Thank you. Delighted to lift both of those books up, but a pick, particularly Paris's and how that might relate to many of our listeners right now. Um, where can people go, Sherry, to find out more about you and the great work you're doing? The Leading on Opportunity website is leadingonopportunity.org, and you can find us on all social platforms by, social, by um, searching Leading on Opportunity. Uh, we stay updated to, up to date on things happening, not only in our organization, but in the community as well. And we encourage you to, to check it out. Fantastic. Sherry, thank you. Keep up the good work. And thanks once again for joining me on the path. Thank you so much, Pat. And it's been fun. Well, I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Sherry as much as I did and came away with some practical ideas that can guide you on your leadership journey wherever you are. If it is a new organization or one that you have led for some time, Sherry's got good advice for you, and I hope you agree and can apply it to your leadership path going forward. Don't forget about the show notes. They are available on our website, patentmcdowell.com, where you can find out more about Sherry, her great work at Leading on Opportunity, as well as her book recommendations and other resources she and I discussed. As always, please share this episode with someone else on the path. And if you haven't already, you can subscribe. Just go to our podcast page at patentmcdowell.com and you will see the follow button which will allow you to subscribe to this podcast on any of your favorite podcast platforms. You won't miss out on any of our weekly episodes. They come out every Thursday. Of course, if you like this episode, click on the episodes button at the top of that same page, and you can scroll through thumbnails of some of our most popular episodes or search by topic or guest name. Thanks, as always, for what you're doing in the nonprofit sector, especially right now. And keep up the good work for causes that are most meaningful to you. I'll keep bringing you content that can help you do it even better. Have a great week. I'll see you next time on The Path.